first off, sorry for class of Friday. I don't know if you may have seen me. I was off the, if you come in on cake, you may have seen me pulled off to the side of the road. I got rear-ended there. I was drinking my coffee when it happened. Just coming in, I swear to God, I was sitting there going, you know what, life is pretty sweet right now. Like I'm going to camp, I swear to God, I was, at, I was like, going to campus, this is college, man. I loved college. I've just decided to spend my whole life in college, right? And I was like, and then to walk in in the morning, so like peaceful and like, it's like, oh man, I'm gonna go give the students a big pep talk about how awesome college is and you need to embrace it and stuff. And I, was, I literally was going through this in my head, and then all of a sudden, just like, kaboom, I spilled coffee all over myself. Yeah. Like a student. Yeah, so then I, so I spilled <laughs> coffee all over myself, and I was like, just, I mean, it burned me. You know, not bad, but I mean, just enough to make me angry. And then I was like, my truck, it's my baby, right? And I get out, I was like, I'm, I'm fucking gonna, I'm gonna lay into this guy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick his ass. I might not fight him, but I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna be mad at him. I pop out, the guy gets out, and he's the starting defensive end for the Bobcats. And I was like, you know, my bad, man. My bad. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have been driving so close in front of you. My bad, right? Like my, my apologies, you know. But he's a super nice guy. He's actually a, a student that I, that I've had in class before too, and he was super apologetic and and I mean upset and everything. But that's uh, understandable. But uh, anyway, so everything, everybody's fine. My truck is gonna be fine. The frame is fine. That's the most part I was worried about. Just cosmetic damage. So. Uh, anyways, so hopefully you didn't wait here too long. I said, I posted that like, kind of, I had to wait for the cops to arrive and all that stuff. So hopefully everybody didn't wait here too long. So, uh, so really quick, we're going to start out with a little presentation, ASCE uh, mechanicals. You're, you're welcome to join this too. I think, I don't know. Yeah. If you wanted to, but, uh, but he's going to give you a little talk about that, a little recruiting speech, and then we'll dive into uh, our notes and kind of keep going with everything. So go ahead. Sorry. Howdy y'all. My name's Sam. I'm senior. Civil Engineering. Uh, I'm this year's uh, competition captain for ASCE. Uh, those of you who don't know, ASCE is the American Society for Civil Engineers. Uh, we are the ones who made the big pretty concrete canoe out in the middle of Norm that I'm really happy nobody has graffitied yet. Uh, we also do the steel bridge competitions, so those of you who are mechanicals, that might be a little bit more up your alley. Uh, if you don't know how to weld, great opportunity to learn. Uh, yeah, but ASCE is a really, really great opportunity to uh, go from just being, you know, average students like, okay, you got a great GPA, but what do you do with your life? You know, you go for a uh, job, or go into a job interview, you got awesome resume, you got 4.0, and you know, you got stuff like, oh, I like walking my dog and going hiking, <laughs> awesome. That makes you really, uh, really unique. But then <laughs> you go and add ASCE on there, and that just puts you a mile ahead of everybody else if you're civil. I don't know how it's gonna help you if you're mechanical too much, but. Uh, as a civil engineer, like when I started doing stuff for ASC, that's when I started getting interviews. That's when I started getting jobs. Like, who here wants a internship at some point in time? Smart people get internships. They'll get you a job. Yeah. So honestly, ASC is a really, really great way. Uh, one of the things we like to do are uh, career mixers. So, you know, career fair is pretty much the speed dating version of <laughs> applying for jobs. You show up, there's a hundred different employers say, hi, I'm such and such, please hire me. They say, no, thank you, move on. Whereas the crew mixtures, it's one-on-one, -on -one. it's a lot more informal setting. It's, you know, you go in for like a dinner. You walk up and say, hi, I'm Billy Bob Jones, please hire me, I'm friendly, I promise. And then, you know, you show up for a career fit or the next day and they hire you, it's great. Uh, ooh, can I? Heck yeah. We also like to do a lot of trips. So uh, those of you who are environmental or civil, really just anything, uh, we'll usually do a tour of Berkeley Pit. So we'll go down to Butte, look at one of the largest super fun sites in the US. So those of you who don't know, it's just this giant toxic pit where they used to mine a whole bunch and now it's just filled in lakes or it's a big lake essentially and birds will land in it and they die. And so there's people whose entire jobs literally sit around the outside of this pit with like flares and fireworks and stuff and they just shoot at birds all day. That's their entire job. Just to make sure that birds don't land there, kill themselves. Uh, we'll usually do uh, skill development workshops. So we've had resume workshops, uh, really just polish up the resume. Um, resume is a really, really good way to get your foot in the door for any inter interview. Uh, steam tunnel tours. Uh, those of you who don't know that, we have tunnels underneath campus. They're pretty cool. You just walk around underneath the sub and be like, oh, okay, yeah, this is here. 
I don't really know what they're there for, but they're there. It's cool. And uh, construction site tours. Those are a lot of fun. I uh, go to an actual construction site, go and check out, hey, this is what it looks like when a building is half being half built, half furnished, and you really get to see a lot more about uh, the actual process. Because a lot of our classes, you know, especially for civils, it'll be, hey, here's how you, you know, figure out the moment reaction at the end of this beam being loaded. But the actual construction site tour says, okay, yeah, here's the process. So we start with here, we start here, we'll do this, and get to ask a lot of really, really good questions and get to know the trade a little bit better. And uh, leadership opportunities, that's a really big one. Right now, just about everybody in ASE is a senior. So we are all graduating and we will not be here because as much as we love college and we love ASE, we really don't wanna be here another year unless we're going to grad school. But that's another topic. And you, get, you guys are sophomores, juniors, mostly thereabouts? Yeah, yeah, so show up and if you participate a whole lot, yeah, you'll probably be leadership. Uh, I think last year, but the deciding factor for who got to be leadership was there were three people left. And so president, vice president, co-vice president. <laughs> and so it worked out really nicely. Um, our faculty advisor, how do we work this? There we go, is Dr. Kirsten Madison. If you guys wanna get on our email list, scan that QR code, um, give you updates. Uh, I think not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, we're going to be in the lab working with concrete for the first time. So in a lot of you who haven't taken structures yet, you'll get to get in the lab to start working with concrete a lot, lot sooner than you would if you just did it as a normal junior. Because I think you don't really get to be in the lab till second semester of your junior year normally with structures too, right? Yep. Yeah, so if you're a sophomore, do you want to get in the lab? It's a really, really great opportunity. We're pretty much just going to be taking concrete and making sculptures with it. You want to make like a little ducky? Great. If you want to make something a little bit less appropriate, great. You know, just no. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. We we found some inappropriate things in there last, <laughs> last time. Yeah, yep. Okay, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so sign up. Uh, if you have any questions, talk to Dr. Madison. If you see me running around, you have any questions, ask me questions. Happy to answer anything. Uh, I'll leave you all to it. Cool. Thanks, man. Thank you, Dr. Berry. Questions? Do you have any questions? No? I don't know. Question? Nope. All right. Y'all have a good one. Thanks, Oh, cool. thanks. I'll follow up with a couple of things. You should get involved. He's, he's right. Absolutely get involved in something, right? Like, that's the part of the college experience. It does differentiate you from from some of your, you know, competition, the other people that are out there, right? Just having that, to, being able to say like, oh, I was in ASME or ASCE, or I built a go-kart, or I built a concrete canoe, or I did something like that. It's just a little something extra that for your resume to kind of set you aside. The second follow-up item, the reason the steam tunnel's there are that there's a heating plant. All the heat on campus comes from that heating plant over there. So there's they, that's where all the heat is generated, which is the steam that then they pipe through the underground tunnels into each of the buildings. They have their pipes. I've had students think that the tunnels were filled with steam. The tunnels are not filled with steam. The tunnels are just there so that the pipes of steam can go into these places. And so, uh, so like Cobley Hall and Roberts and the Montana Hall, all that heat from all those buildings come from that heating plant over here. And I think the only ones that aren't coming from there are like, I believe like this building is, is independent from that because this is geothermal heat as opposed to like using the, the steam over there. So, of things. Okay, all right, let's, just, let's keep going with this stuff. All right, we did, what we did, right, what we were in the middle of was projectile motion. I kind of looked at it, I, I was trying to motivate myself to record a lecture, and then I was putting myself in your guys' foot, uh, in your shoes, and it's like, you got over, uh, over Labor Day weekend, you didn't want to watch a uh, video, I didn't want to make a video, right? So I was like, all right, well, we'll just make it up at some point. So we're going to be, we're off a little, we're off one day in our lectures, but that's, I'm okay with it if you're okay with it, right? I think what we'll do is somewhere along the line, I'll record a lecture and we'll kind of get caught up. But right now we're fine. Our first exam isn't until the 30th. So we've got some time to, to cover some, some, some basic or some stuff there. So everything's all good. I did short, I did assign the homework yesterday. I forgot to do that on Friday, but it is, it's very short. And it's just this, this 2D Cartesian stuff. It shouldn't be hard for you to do it all, okay? 
And so get started on that. There is a recitation session tonight, right? Five to seven, I think. And so it will hopefully just, he'll hopefully just continue with uh, problems like this. So what we did, just kind of refresh since it's been a week, right? As we said, let's, let's define in a certain coordinate system. We're going to do Cartesian coordinate system. So this is just a system of 1D equations. And we said, yep, let's define position. It's X in the I, Y in the J, and Z in the K. That's how we're going to do vectors. You take the derivative of that position with respect to time and it gives you the velocity. That's what we did here. And then all these, you know, so this is using the product rule. This thing kind of blew up on us a little bit. But all of these derivatives of the coordinate system with respect to time, all of those go to zero because that coordinate system is fixed. Today we're going to go, we're going to do normal tangent coordinate systems where that's no longer the case. Those will not be fixed. They're actually, the coordinate system is moving. And so when we take the derivative of the coordinate system, we actually get something instead of getting zero. So, so basically, this is what it ended up being. Our velocity was just Vx in the i, Vy in the j, and Vz in the k, kind of independent, right? What's happening in the x is not happen, or does not affect what's happening in the j, which does not happen, it does not affect what's happening in the k direction. They're kind of three independent, independent directions, and you just solve them as three 1D problems, okay? We then take the derivative of that velocity, and it gives us the acceleration. And the same thing happened where all these taking the derivatives of the coordinate system, all those things go to zero. And all you're left with is this independent, what's happening in the x does not affect what's happening in the y, which does not affect what's happening in the z. And so it's kind of three independent problems. Okay, classic example is projectile motion. Right? This is kind of high school physics. And then we did an example problem, right, where this, we had this car traveling to the right or something, a particle traveling to the right. We had this gun up here that you could change the initial velocity, but you could not change the direction. So it was, it was stuck in a three, four, five triangle. And we launched that and it shot out and it hits A, right? And so we were asked to figure out what that initial velocity is required to hit A. So what we did is we figured out what the position of uh, A was in the X and Y direction. And then we figured out what the position of B was in the X and Y direction. And then we set the X directions equal to each other, or sorry, the X positions equal to each other and the Y positions equal to each other. And then that's kind of where things were left off. So we came up with an equation to, we went through and we've had, there's the, there's the equation for the position of A in the X direction. There's the equation of position, or, or that's the equation for the position of A in the Y direction position of B in the X direction and position of B in the Y direction. And so for this thing to hit each other, they gotta have the same position. So what we did is we set this thing, SBX equal to SAX, and then we set SAY equal to SBY, right? Couple ways to do that, right? You could do substitution where you, where you solve for T and take that T and put it in the other equation and go. Or in my case, I just plugged it into my calculator Right? I owe you guys, a, I, 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 we've tried to get the TAs to learn how to do the calculator stuff. So at rec recitations in the TA help center, they can kind of show you how to do it with your calculator. I highly recommend a TI-89, if, if I haven't mentioned that before. Try to track one of those things out. It's pretty straightforward to do it in there. You can do systems of equations. You can do all sorts of stuff in there. Uh, and so, oh, I didn't forget, I forgot my notes here. Hold on. I don't have to do it on my phone. For the answer here. We never got as far as giving you the answer when you plug that into your calculator. It is... bring my calculator today, so I got to give it a here. Uh, T is equal to 2.22 seconds. So when you plug that into your calculator, you get T is equal to 2.22 seconds, and V naught is equal to 15.28 seconds. So those are your answers, right? After that point, it's just algebra, right? It's just algebra to solve that problem. I always just, when I get to the algebra calculator, right? Don't waste your, your time, right? 
thinking about how, how to do this. Just plug it in the calculator. Because those are the two unknowns, two equations, two unknowns. Unknown is time and V naught. Okay. All right, eight questions about that problem. Yeah. Would blocking mean beat the second? Yeah, yeah, yep. I wasn't done yet. <laughs> See, like, is that funny every time I do that? I just, I, what's wrong with V naught here? Oh, it's the unit. See, I, I set you up. It is, are we, is everything in feet? Is that what it is? Yeah. Yep. Feet per second, absolutely. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, another example, right? Given a projectile, and this one's a little bit different, right? And this, they can do it this way. You, you know, usually, the, every problem we've done so far, they've given us like an acceleration, and then we're after what the velocity and then working our way to position, kind of going that direction. This one's a little bit different because they give us uh, the equation for position. So this is x as a function of time and then y as a function of time. So it's a little bit backwards, okay? And in fact, I like these ones a little bit better because you're taking derivatives of things instead of integrating them. So, uh, so what we have to go is from those equations for position to the acceleration vector to the velocity vector, max height and range. And that's just really similar to a homework problem that you have this week. Okay, so what we do is we start looking at the derivatives of these things. So this is x of t, and so we can calculate how does this change with respect to time. x of t is equal to 86t, okay? x dot is equal to 86, and x double dot is equal to 0. So this is vx, this is ax, right? So if I just take the, how does the x position change with respect to time, the dot being the uh, uh, derivative with respect to time, that's just 86, that's vx. Take the second derivative of, it, of that, how does it change, uh, how does that velocity change with respect to time? It's zero. And so this is kind of a projectile motion problem, right? You see ax, there is no acceleration in the x direction. Once it launches, that's all it is. Okay, and then it has an initial velocity of 86 in the x direction. You do the same thing in the y direction. Y of t, what was it? 96t minus 4.91. Minus 4.91t squared. That's what y of t is. We look at y dot. Take the time derivative of that, 96 minus 9.82 t. So this is what vy is. And then take the second derivative of it, y double dot, is negative 9.82. That's what ay is. All right, and again, you can kind of see that this is a projectile motion problem, right? Right, you got gravity there, right? Slightly gravity. I mean, it's 9.81 is what we use, but just the way that the math worked out there, negative 9.82. So this is, that's, that's what we should get. We get this negative 9.82 for the acceleration in the y direction because this is just a projectile, okay? So that's, we're almost there, right? So it says, what is the acceleration vector, okay? So we just take ax and ay, acceleration vector. This is part one. The acceleration vector is just going to be ax in the i direction plus ay in the j direction and substitute in ax that's zero so it's 9.82 in the j direction meters per second squared okay simple as that right you just we just took it from those equations and then put it in the vector form AX is zero, AY is just that negative 9.82. Part two says the velocity vector at T equals zero. So let's write down the velocity vector first. Velocity vector is just going to be VX in the I direction plus VY in the J direction. 86 in the I plus... 96 minus 9.82 T in the J. 
And sometimes it's nice to put parentheses around that just to show that both of those things are in the J direction. A lot of times we don't put those put those parentheses around it, but that just, when it's all kind of close to the J, it just means that it's in the J direction. But if, you, if it's helpful to put those, uh, those parentheses around it, just say both of those things are in the J direction and go for it. Okay, so both of those in the J direction. But it said at T equals zero, so we just plug in zero for that T. The problem statement asked for that, so then this just ends up being 86 in the I plus 96 in the J. So I just plugged in T equals zero into that equation above. Okay. Third part says the max height. How am I going to find the max height? Yep, velocity in which direction? Y. Velocity in the Y direction equals zero. So right when it's up here at the cusp, right where it's up here, right? So it's, it's got an upward velocity, and right there it starts getting, a, you know, right at the cusp of going down is where you're going to find that max. And so it's where VY is equal to zero. Is that VY equal to zero? That was... And VY is equal to zero. So VY is 96 minus 9.82T. Zero. That tells me that T is equal to. I have to calculate it real quick if you want. Uh, uh, it's 9.78 seconds. Right? That's not what it asked. It'd say how much time. So then if I get the max height, I go back to my y equation. Y at T is equal to 9.78 seconds. So my Y equation is just this equation right here, right, that they give us. So you just come back and put 9.78 into that equation right there. And when you do that, you get 469 meters. That's the answer there. Okay, and the last part of this says, what's the range? I think we do range in this one. How far does it go? Close, not X. Y, right, that's exactly right. When the Y is equal to negative 120 is, is how far out it's gone, right? That's exactly right. So then we do that. We come in here and say Y, y is equal to, um, the Y equation is 96T minus 4.91T. We set that equal to one, negative 120. Negative 120. Right? You may have said that I, uh, do you wanna set that equal to negative 120? Plug that sucker into my calculator. Literally out pops this. T is equal to 20.73 seconds. Okay, and then we come back and you take X of t equal to 20.73. And then that gives us 1783 meters. Right. Little high school physics stuff. All right. But not bad, not bad stuff. Okay, this one again was just a little bit different because we started out with the pos position vector or positions and then we worked our way to velocities and then accelerations as opposed to the other way around. Yeah. You could do that. If you want to get into the ha habit of just, if you put it in the brackets and then have them separate, that's fine with me. Yep. Where it gets a little bit weird is now. Where the next thing we cover is there's now instead of I's, J's, and K's, there's E, T's, and E, N's, and then there's going to be E, Thetas, and E, R's at some point. But still, even them, you, even those, you can treat that way. So 
but we'll we'll cover that in a second. Yeah. Okay. All that stuff is about it. All just review your physics. Okay. Then now we're starting to drift away a little bit. This is angular motion. Right? This still too might be a little bit of review. So instead of instead of defining something as being what its x and y coordinate is, right? Sometimes we're talking about how things rotate, right? And if things that are rotating, sometimes it's easier to talk about uh, what its position is and then what theta is. And we'll, we'll, that's like polar coordinate stuff. We'll get to that in a little bit. But it's just even simpler than that. If we've got this vector e that's pointed out here, and that e can can be moving, okay, and so it will have it could be rotating, and there's a theta in here, that angle right there we'll call theta, and if e is moving and kind of rotating a little bit, going from one step, uh, one point to another, so that theta would be changing. It'd be going one theta to another theta, okay. And that theta could change quickly or that th theta could change slowly, right? Or, and it, or it could be accelerating, right? It could change in all those things. So, what and this is going to come up a lot. This is going to come up in rigid bodies. This is kind of like fundamental to what we're doing for now. So, that theta could be changing. That angle could be changing. The rate at which that angle changes is what we call angular velocity, okay? And we call that omega. Omega is the rate at which theta changes theta dt and that's also we interchangeably call that theta dot okay and this would be kind of if it's rotating like this okay that'd be this is omega Right, how that thing is changing with respect to time. There's also angular acceleration, is how does that angle, how is the rate that that velocity is changing, that angular velocity changing? That's what we call alpha. Alpha is equal to d omega dt, or d squared theta dt squared. That would be the second derivative of theta which we can call that theta double dot. Right? Or we can even call that omega dot. There's all a whole bunch of different ways to represent that. Right? Take the derivative of omega with respect to time, which is the same as taking the second derivative of theta with respect to time, which is the same as theta double dot, which is the same as omega dot. And throughout the book and our derivations and stuff, we use those things very interchangeably, right? We go between calling something, we go between calling something omega dot and theta double dot and, and theta dot and omega. Like we just kind of interchangeably use those things. So just kind of get used to that. So those are this, this new idea, this, this angle of something that's rotating that has a velocity. It can have a velocity. It can be changing with respect to time. It can also have an acceleration with respect to time as well, right? There's ways that you can write this thing in vector notation. These things have directions. Omega has a direction and alpha has a direction. Vector notation, this omega, ooh, omega, oh, I want black. The omega vector is omega in the k direction. And then alpha, I'm going to draw as a negative here, negative alpha in the k direction. I'm going to draw an alpha that's in the negative direction. This would be a negative alpha. I'm going to say this as drawn. I'll explain where that, how you can tell the direction in, in a second. So what we use is we use the right hand rule for kind of determining which direction these things are going. It's kind of the first time right hand rule is very key in this class. Lots of stuff going on. But what I do is I take my fingers and I just I kind of have them like this and I have them rotate in the direction of omega. Right? So omega is going like this, and which direction is my thumb pointed? It's pointed out in the k direction. Okay? So if I take that, rotate it like that, point it out that direction. Like that, point it out. The reason that alpha is in, is in the negative direction, the way it's drawn, right? And I rotate my fingers in the direction of alpha. Now my thumb is pointed into the board, so that's a negative k direction, right? And so 
It's really key in all of our problems is determining whether or not it's a positive alpha or negative alpha or a positive omega or a negative omega. So just kind of get used to that. First time with the using the right hand rule in here. I always ask people if it's harder if, as a left handed person to do the right hand rule. Like if you just like, ugh, ugh, I can't use my right hand, right? But I've had some lefties tell me actually they have an advantage because while they're doing the right hand rule, they can be writing. Right, so they don't have to slow down. There's like, how do left-handed people write like this? Right, <laughs> that's right. How many lefties are in here? I'm making fun of you. That's right. You got, <laughs> you do it right. You gotta write like this so you don't smear the ink. Right? Yeah, that's right. I know. You're deformed a little bit. That's okay. That's okay. But you again, you have an advantage. You have an advantage because you can do the right-hand rule while. There's a store in Seattle just for left-handed people. Have you guys, yep. you've been to this? Yeah. Did you get anything? A pair of left-handed scissors, right? Is that that's a thing, right? Left-handed scissors suck. They're really sad. Did you get some at the left-handed store? Not at that store. No. Interesting. Make note. Make note. Who's who's my lefties in here? Okay. So that so, so that's some key things. We're gonna use this quite a bit these coordinates okay so that's that's a new thing you do have a homework problem you do have a homework problem one homework problem where you're dealing with some stuff this angular motion this is the first time you kind of see it in this class but we're going to use it time and time again i got a little note here of a hint on 13 100 hint on this is the one problem you have 13 100 you're gonna to wanna to use this. So alpha, in that particular problem, you have alpha function of theta. This is just d omega, we're gonna use the chain rule. d omega dt, you multiply it by d theta d theta. So you get d omega, d theta, d theta, dt. That's multiplying by d theta d theta, and this is just omega. You're gonna to wanna to use this guy. when you get there right you're gonna to want to use the chain rule because that particular problem they give you alpha as a function of theta which we know how to do that's alpha that's acceleration acceleration a function of position and we did that before we used the chain rule to do this it's just now it's in this different coordinate system that might throw you off a little bit instead of a being a function of s it's now alpha function of theta so use that when you do 13 100 Okay, so that's, uh, we got to cover one little thing, and then we're going to get into normal tangent coordinate system. Okay, so this is back to our statement before. So we're going to have a, this has to do with, when we talked about before, when we take the derivative of the coordinate system that went to zero, now when we take the derivative of the coordinate system, it's not going to be zero. We're going to use this. This is kind of like, it's a precursor to that. We have to do this first, and we're going to use it in a derivation in a second. Okay, so there's a position vector, we'll call it ET. Let's point it out to a point. All right, and a short time later, that thing is moved to another position. Call this E of E of T plus delta T. And then there's a vector that goes in between them from one to the other, but we're going to call delta E. Okay. And the thing that we're going to use is this right here. We're going to say the delta E. And this, the book goes through a full derivation. We're going to just kind of give you the highlights and then you're going to trust me. But this delta E is perpendicular to E. You can kind of see that. And it's not too hard to see there. Like if it's out there and it moves, and especially at small displacements, right? It goes out there and then the change between them, delta E, as delta T approaches zero, delta E is perpendicular. Meaning that this is just, this is a right angle here. Okay. In true triangle sense, it's not. Right? Because 
right? If this, this, is, this didn't change length, that's the same length and that's the same length. And so that can't be a right angle, otherwise it'll miss it, right? But as delta T becomes really small, like just the instant afterwards, just right afterwards, we're gonna consider that a right angle, okay? Again, that, that, and that we are deal, dealing with differential space, and so that is true at, as delta t approaches zero. So we're going to introduce this new vector. That's just, that's just the direction perpendicular to E. And that symbol there just means perpendicular. So this n that we just added, it just means that's a direction perpendicular I can't draw a straight line here. There you go. All right. This is a new thing. Like I said, the book goes through a full derivation of that, but like, if you trust me there with that delta E, I can buy that delta E to be perpendicular there. Okay, so this is the part that we need. If I take the derivative, if I say how is E changing with respect to time, so how is that E changing with respect to time? It is equal to d theta dt in the n direction. And theta, this is omega right. So this is what I need right here. If I say if I take the derivative of how is how is e changing with respect to time? Well, it is just omega in the n direction. It's just, that d, it's just that d theta dt in a direction that's perpendicular to et. That's all we know. It's just it's how is d theta changing with respect to time in the, e, in the n direction. Right? Again, book goes through full derivation. Do you need it for this? No. Just trust that that, is, that works if you want. Open up your book. Read through that full, full derivation. It'll talk, talk through. Again, we need this on the next page when we introduce normal tangent coordinates. Okay? There's also a vector notation for this. To try to figure out the directions of these things, we'll walk through that in a second. So the other way to do it is using this cross product, omega crossed with E, right? That's another way of writing that same thing. You do get the same result. You get omega in a direction perpendicular to E. And the way that this right hand rule works, we're going to use this quite a bit in, in classes. I come back here and I say it's omega crossed with E. So what you do is you point your fingers in the direction of the first thing. That's how you do a cross product. The, the omega, your, your fingers in the direction of the first thing, and then you curl them in the direction of the second thing. Okay, so the first thing, we're doing omega crossed with E. So I take my omega. Which way is omega going in this? Yep, omega's coming out, right? So I roll my fingers in the direction of omega and it shows my omega's coming out of the page. So omega's direction is that way. I take my fingers in that direction and I cross them in the E direction. Look where my thumb is pointed, right? My thumb is pointed perpendicular to E. Right? Over there to this side of the class, I ignore this side of the class. I'm weird, I always lecture on that side, but, right? Omega like this, thumb's coming out like that. Take my fingers in the direction of omega, I roll them in the direction of E, okay? And then now my thumb is pointed in the direction of delta E, right? So that's just like the vector notation of figuring out where those things are at. We're gonna use that one quite a bit as well, right? This whole, especially when we get in 2D rigid bodies, lots of cross products and stuff like that that are taking place. You may use those with R cross F for your moments in statics, right? R cross F, that gives you the moments that. Anyways, this little thing. Okay, new coordinate system. We got about 13 minutes to go through this. All right, sometimes, the, and we'll do some examples, especially in a circle. This will mainly be used for, for modeling circles and stuff, but sometimes your Cartesian coordinate system just isn't the best, right? You like it, you're comfortable with it, it's pretty straightforward, but sometimes it's not gonna be your best bet. Sometimes another coordinate system is going to make more sense, right? The book covers this one right here. It starts out with normal tangent, and it'll do, we'll do polar coordinates a little bit uh, in a little bit. But let's, let's introduce it, okay? When would you use a normal tangent coordinate system? I said sometimes it's going to be better. When the path is clearly defined. So if they give you an equation for the path, sometimes they give you a full equation for the path. If that's the case, this normal tangent is going to be, your, be, be good for you, okay? Uh, and in this particular one, 
coordinates are normal and tangent to the path. Well, what do I mean by that? So there's my path. It's defined. I'm going to draw my coordinate system on here. I've got one coordinate system that's going to be tangent to the path. Okay. And then I'm going to have one that's normal to the path, right? Adjacent to it. Just as the name implies. Right? This one, I'm going to call ET. Uh-oh. This one right here is going to be en hat. We'll define each of those in a second here. I'll write them out here. Okay, so that's that's our, our coordinates. So, so they're on the path, right? In our Cartesian coordinate system, they're off to the side and they're pointing right there. In this particular case, it's actually attached to, to that particle. Okay, it's on the path, it's on that particle, okay? Um, let's define each of these things. ET, ET hat, unit vector tangent to path. That's what ET is. Unit vector. What does it mean to be a unit vector? It just means it has direction but no magnitude. Magnitude of one. Okay. EN at. That is unit vector normal to the path. Pointed towards the instantaneous center of curvature a little bit more involved in there it's a unit vector it's normal to the uh, normal to the path but it's pointed back towards the inst instantaneous center of curvature okay and okay, so on this little graph over here right this thing's curving this way right curving around that way so the center of curvature is back that direction so that's why it's pointed back there and then et is over here okay if i was at a different position a little bit later on over here right et again is in the direction of the path so et is going this i'm gonna move these guys ET is doing that. And then now, though, instead of pointed to upwards, this thing's pointed back to the middle. And all sorts of stuff. This is what I said before. It's changing with respect to time, right? It's it's traveling that that coordinate system's traveling along the path. It's going like this, and then it's like this, then it's like this, and then once it gets up there, it starts, and then it actually flips, and it's going like this. It's going to start curving back that way. If it curved back up later, it would flip over the other directions, right? So we take the derivative of that coordinate system. It's not going to be zero because that coordinate system is moving, right? You know, why is it moving? Well, it just it helps us this way. Okay, we're going to define acceleration and velocity in terms of this coordinate system, it just makes our lives a little bit better, okay? Everybody see that? Kind of pointing back to the center curvature, it's changing with respect to time. And they are just vectors. When we write these things, we're gonna write in, as vectors, instead of i and j, you're gonna write them as et and en. In which directions do et and en point? Well, they point tangent to the path and back to the end, and, and it's always changing, right? So it's not as clearly defined what it is, but we'll, we'll see why it, help, it helps in a little bit, okay? Um, S, ooh, a couple things else to define here. S is distance along the path. Along the path, right? And rho, we haven't defined what rho is. I'm gonna define what rho is. Rho is equal to the radius of curvature.
right, is the radius of curvature. So S is just is the distance along the path. I don't need a picture for that. But the radius of curvature would be, right, this is curving around something, right? It has, it has a center of curvature someplace. That center of curvature is back here. And that distance to that center of curvature is what we call rho. That distance is rho. Right, and then over there, there's an, and, and that rho is changing with respect to time, too. It, it's not necessarily fixed. If it's a circle, rho is fixed. But if it's not a circle, then rho is not fixed. Rho can be changing with respect to time as well. Right? If the curvature is, I mean, obviously it is here, right? Because it's, it's curving and it's slowing down and it's actually flipping directions. And so that rho could be changing as well. But it is just the instantaneous radius of curvature. Okay, a lot of these things are instantaneous. Okay. Any questions about that? So that's we've just defined the coordinate system, okay? Uh, but we've not defined what velocity is or acceleration. So that's what we have to do in each of these coordinate systems. Is, is now we've kind of defined the coordinate system. We're talking about dynamics, so things are moving. So we have to define velocity and acceleration. So velocity in this case, in this coordinate system, is super easy. Velocity velocity is always tangent to the path. So in the T. So it's always just in the ET direction. The way that this coordinate, that's the way this coordinate system is set up, right, is V to ET is tangent to the path. So if we're talking about velocity, What's going to be how is S changing with respect to time? How is the position along that path changing with respect to time? In the ET direction. Always in the ET direction. No EN direction ever, right? Because if it's in the EN direction, it means it's not on the path. It has to be on the path. So that's velocity. Pretty easy. Okay. Now to get acceleration, I take the, velo the derivative of the velocity. Acceleration. Acceleration is just the derivative of the velocity vector with respect to time. The velocity vector is um, the v in the et direction. The little hat, by the way, the little hat that I put on the e, when you put a little hat, little carrot on it, is another term for it. That just means it's a unit vector. And okay? whenever we have unit vectors, the I's, the J's, and the K's, those are all unit vectors. That's why I put hats on them. ET is just a unit vector, so we put a hat on it versus a, a bar across it. Okay? So I take the derivative of V in ET direction DT. Right? I have to apply the product rule here. So this would be DV DT in the ET direction plus V times DE hat DT. That's just the product rule. Take the derivative of the first thing, leave the second thing alone. Take the, leave the first thing alone, take the derivative of the second thing. So this is, back to my, I keep giving this foreshadowing. Right here, we're taking the derivative of ET with respect to time. We're taking the derivative of the, uh, of that unit vector, of the base vector, of our coordinate system. Take that derivative. In this case, that does not go to zero because ET is changing, right? We, already, we just said that. It's point, it, the direction it's pointed is constantly changing. So we take the derivative of that with respect to time. It does not go to zero. It actually is something. So we're going to use the little identity that we had before and say I'm taking the derivative of a base vector, DET, dt, we said was just going to be d theta dt in a direction that's perpendicular to et. And in this case, a direction perpendicular to et is the en hat. So you can add a little note, say, previous page. Right. The previous page is where we kind of discuss this. Take the derivative of a base vector. It's just d theta dt in a direction that's perpendicular to that original direction. In this case, we've defined that as being en. So perpendicular to et is just being the e direction. 
the end direction. Okay, so then that gets substituted in up above. Right? That goes up into here. Okay, and we're almost to where we were after. Uh, we could also say that this is equal to omega, just to kind of write it a different way, omega in the en direction. Right, d theta dt is just is just that. Actually, we get to go right down there. I already written this. So this is what acceleration is. It's kind of in a weird form. You're not used to seeing it in that form. We'll get we'll cover that next time. But there there it is. Right. We got. Acceleration is V dot in the ET direction. V dot is just DS DT. How is the position along the path changing with respect to time in the ET direction? And then we have this other part on there, which is V times theta dot, okay? This right here is speed, is change in speed. Right? And then this component right here is acceleration from change in direction. Okay. So the first part is how is the speed change? So if you're driving in a car, that's me stepping on the gas and I'm accelerating along my path. That's me stepping on my gas is the first part. Because I'm stepping on the gas causes me to change my speed. The other one is change in direction. So if I turn my wheel, I have to accelerate to the right, right? And this is, or if I turn my wheel to the left, I have to accelerate to the left, right? And if I don't, any change in direction causes an acceleration. What is that acceleration called? Centripetal, yeah, that's a centripetal acceleration, right? So this, it's in a form that you're not, you, I mean, it's a slightly different, you, you, V times theta dot, what the hell is that? We're gonna write it in a couple different ways. In, in next time, we'll cover what that is. It's just V squared over R or R omega squared. You've seen those before, but it's just the centripetal acceleration that's associated with it. It's kind of neat that that popped out of there, right? So in cases where there is centripetal acceleration, this and polar coordinates is the way you're gonna wanna go. You're not gonna wanna do those in Cartesian coordinates. Go cool beans, break. Work on your homework. Go to recitation ses session. See you guys on Friday.